Hi everyone, I'm excited to announce that the 8-week online Transcend course is back. Become certified in learning the latest science of human potential and learn how to live a more fulfilling, meaningful, creative, and self-actualized life. The new cohort starts on June 25th and will include more than 10 hours of recorded lectures, live group Q&A sessions with me, small group sessions with our world-class faculty, a plethora of resources and articles to support your learning, and an exclusive workbook of growth challenges that will help you overcome your deepest fears and grow as a whole person. There are even some personalized self-actualization coaching spots available with our world-class faculty as an add-on. I'm happy to announce that just for Psychology Podcast listeners, you can get 20% off the course by going to transcendcourse.com and entering Psych Podcast in the coupon box. We will be closing registration soon, so I suggest signing up as soon as possible. We have so much fun in this course, and you will receive a lot of support along your self-actualization journey. Just go to transcendcourse.com to register and enter P-S-Y-C-H-P-O-D-C-A-S-T, Psych Podcast, in the coupon box. I look forward to welcoming you to the Transcender community. There ain't nobody else making our choices but us. We might like to think so, but um, we're responsible, Mm. and that's scary, but it's also tremendously empowering if you fully grasp it. Hello, and welcome to the Psychology Podcast. Today, we welcome back Ken Sheldon to the show. Ken is a curator's distinguished professor of psychological science at the University of Columbia, Missouri. He has written and edited over 200 academic books, scholarly articles, and book chapters. Among these, some of his most notable work include Optimal Human Being and Self-Determination Theory in the Clinic. His latest book is called Freely Determined, What the New Psychology of the Self Teaches Us About How to Live. In this episode, I talked to Ken Sheldon about free will. Instead of questioning its existence, Ken is concerned with how we might use free will to help us reach our goals. Each person has the capacity to make good and bad choices, and to learn from the past. Although we are unable to know everything about ourselves, we can still make informed decisions. Believing that we have the ability to choose directly affects our well-being and values. We also touch on the topics of neuroscience, self-determination, and responsibility. I really enjoyed this conversation with Ken. I find him really insightful, and especially when it comes to this quite heated topic within academia, this topic of do we have free will or not, I like his perspective. I think it's fresh, and I think it really draws a lot on psychological science as opposed to uh, maybe more metaphysical ideas. Wherever you stand on the free will debate, we'd love to hear from you. Please come into the comments, and at the very least, I hope this conversation stimulated some deep thought and reflection on this very important and fascinating topic. So without further ado, I bring you Ken Sheldon. Ken, it's so great to have you on the Psychology Podcast. Yeah, it's great to be here. I think I was uh, with you a few years ago, but things have uh, kind of changed a little bit since then, so it'll be good to reconnect. Yeah, absolutely. A lot has changed in the world. Uh, And last time we talked about your brilliant work on the uh, optimal human. So you wrote this fascinating new book uh, called Freely Determined. I had to take the cover off because it's hard to read it with the cover falling off. But anyway, um, Freely Determined. Congratulations on the publication of this book. And it adds some new ideas into this space, this free will debate space. Um, I noticed you don't get too mirrored down in the philosophy of mind, rigorous, nuanced debate, you know, and you know, you don't even stake a position. I, I don't think you anywhere in the book did you say, I'm a compatibilist, you know, I feel like you focus a lot on the psychology of it. But what are you within that within that whole debate? Like, have you do you do you identify as with a particular? Are, are you a compatibilist? Are you something else? Um, probably you would call me a compatibilist. compatibilist. Uh, what I'm trying to say is that um, you can have determinism and free will at the same time. You just have to recognize that um, human higher mental processes are part of the determining formula. You know, that um, what we do way up here in this abstract mental world that we live in is part of what determines the behaviors that we take. And I don't think that it's reducible to any of the lower level machinery. Uh, The machinery gives us the capacity to do what we do, but it doesn't determine what we do. Instead, we selves attempting to operate our own minds, taking advantage of all this machinery we have um, 
are really kind of running the show for better or worse. This sounds like a debate that you have with your father. Is that right? He he has a he's a very deterministic view of the situation. Yeah, I start off the book talking about these debates going you know way back into my teens with my dad, who was a, a law professor and but also a determinist. Was kind of a funny thing. He didn't think people should be punished for their crimes because they couldn't help doing them. Hmm. Um, but hmm. I you know I had the hardest time because his arguments were so undefeatable in some ways. And so you could say that my whole career as a personality psychologist has been about trying to find ways around those arguments or ways to think about them differently that gives us, you know, a viable position as mental entities uh, for taking control of our own lives and for leading the kind of lives that we think we would like. Well, that's that's just it. The leading the lives that we think, well, the leading the lives that we hopefully would like. Uh, that by you, because you go through a lot sorting out the difference, how to find out the difference between what we think we might like and what we do like. So I'm going to give you a little bit more credit than you just gave yourself there <laughs> about okay. the, you know, the kind of life, right? You know, because you go great pains just to for us to really look deep inside and figure that out. You know, like there are a lot of things that we think we should like. There's even things we might think we like that we don't really like. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's not easy. No, we're in this funny position. Um, having free will means the, the, we, can, our, we are also free to make mistakes. We're free to be clueless. We're free to have no idea what we really want. We're free to make terrible choices. But we're also free to learn from those choices and hopefully make better ones in the future. So, you know, the book kind of... Uh, talks about the free will debate early on, and it doesn't really take a position, as you said, it just concludes that there's reasonable doubt, pretty good reason for doubting the determinist perspective. And then it moves on to what I think is the more important question of, okay, if we do have free will, as I'm claiming or saying is probable, uh, how well are we able to use it? And that, I think, is the really important question, because uh, we're kind of cut off. You know, we're living in this mental world, you know, System 2, Daniel Kahneman called it the tyranny of the prefrontal cortex. We're sort of suspended above the machinery above. Uh, we, we have the ability to be out of touch with ourselves. And so the critical question is to get the information, the good information that we need to, to make choices that are going to cause our entire organism to thrive even though we're kind of stuck um, uh, as the conscious representatives of that organism moment to moment, and we might be pretty uh, clueless about what's really happening inside of us. It just seems like you somehow make a distinction between system one being, uh, you know, our unconscious mind, so to speak, that all the things beneath the surface of our conscious awareness that are happening automatically, kind of keeping the system running, uh, without much uh, pre-thought, uh, it seems like that system one you attribute a lot less free will to than system two, which you uh, talk a lot about the symbolic mind, which we'll get to in a second. Yeah. Um, system two being our, our our ability to to plan, to error correct, to change course, to maybe influence our system one. You know that we can influence our system one by changing habits, can't we? You know, it's not like a system one is completely impenetrable. That's right. That's right. So do you actually like weigh the two systems differently in terms of their free will implications? Uh, that's a very excellent question. I haven't thought about it quite that way, but um, I would agree with that assessment. Um, in the book, I adopt uh, a philosopher, Christian Lists. Uh, he wrote a book in 2019 called uh, Why Free Will is Real. And he proposed a definition of free will that put the question squarely into my territory as a goal researcher. He said, free will is nothing more than the ability to ask yourself what you want, call up from your non-conscious mind some possibilities for action, choose one of them, and then get moving. And so that's really a pretty straightforward and kind of intuitive perspective if you think about it. What does it mean for an agent to have free will? It can think about what it wants, and then it can decide, and then it can start trying to get it. And so that's what I've been studying my whole career is how people set goals and how well do they pursue yeah. goals and then how do the goals influence their happiness? 
after they're done pursuing them and perhaps achieving them. So I really love that definition that uh, Christian List provided because it sort of helped me sidestep these centuries of philosophical debate, which I see as uh, pretty impenetrable and very much bogged down. Everybody's got their own position. And I love the ability to sidestep all that and say, well, it's simple. Free will is the ability to think about what you want and make a choice. And that is a system to process. I think it's um, there's a lot of conscious um, stuff going on there where we say, well, wait a minute. What do I do here? Well, I could do this, that, or that. What do I want to do? We think about the future and what will happen in each case. Oh, I think I like option B. I'm going to go for that. And so that's not something that's happening uh, in system one, or at least not in that same way, because system one is more sort of automatic and habitual. So the system two is the, the part of us that is kind of in a representational world, living in a symbolic self. We can talk about that, uh, making choices between alternatives. Yeah, I got to say, I, I love your perspective because it's very much in line with my perspective. Um, and uh I have uh, framed it a little bit differently. I've called it cybernetic free will, but I think we're talking about the same thing. Um, you know, we're cybernetic systems that can can consciously represent the distance between our starting state and our goal state. We can try to consciously develop strategies to reduce that gap so we yeah. can get to where we want to go. Yeah, I mean, I studied, I, I studied with Herbert Simon, so I came from that whole, yeah, that yeah. whole school of... Actually, you know, I love the stuff. I love the cybernetic perspective because it underlies the Carver and Shire approach, which is the main Correct. perspective that I use in my goal research. You know, um, beautiful. Yeah, beautiful. And I don't know if you follow uh, my colleague Colin DeYoung's work at all on cybernetic Big Five theory. Yeah, yeah, I do know his work, uh, but <laughs> okay, very, cool. Very cool. interesting you stuff. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, very interesting. So, so I, I, you know, I, I really uh, believe in that that perspective, and I would just call it cybernetic free will as distinguished from magic free will. But both of us agree. I mean, anyone with a with a with a sane mind <laughs> agrees that uh, that there are we're not outside the causal structure of of nature. That even our system two processes um, are caused by a long series of chain of things that that obviously lay out way outside of our understanding comprehension knowledge going very very far back maybe even to the big bang right i would say that the system two um processes are enabled by lots of stuff and they're influenced by lots right. of stuff a lot of it that we don't know about but that the moment for choice comes and um that the conscious experience of that's the one I want flips the brain into um, an implemental state where it crosses the Rubicon to use Peter Goldwitzer's mm. uh, terminology. And so I don't think that you can predict what the decision of that self of the moment is going to be because it depends on what it wants. And it's a sort of not independent, but a somewhat independent um, process going on in the universe that, again, is enabled by all the machinery, but I don't think it makes any sense to say me agreeing to come on your show was predetermined since the Big Bang, you know, or anything else that you or I did today. Um, and it also doesn't make sense to say that we're magically outside of all that physical stuff. Uh, again, we're influenced by it and we're enabled by it, but um, you know, I think we have a certain degree of independence from it, and that's the independence that allows us to make terrible mistakes. We can even commit suicide. No, no other animal does that. You know, I mean, that's the mm -hmm. ultimate insult to personal survival. We can get so confused that we could take our own life. You know, and that might be, actually, I don't think it is, but the ultimate act of free will is just to deny yourself existence. Mm. But, but more probably those are people who have a lot of emotional problems that are uh, controlling their decision-making to an unhealthy extent. Well, I mean, couldn't someone argue that uh, probabilistically speaking, once you start adding up 
enough factors, external, uh, environmental, and internal factors, suicide ideation starts to get more and more and more and more likely. You know, certainly there's there are still causes, you know, that that allow us to do so. I mean, we were in the social sciences. We 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 don't think we can't predict things at all. And I just think there are some things that have very high correlations, uh, like so strong. For instance, if you find someone, I just thought of this example on the spot, but I was, I was thinking you find someone who's a devout vegetarian or a devout vegan for 30 years, you can predict if you go to a restaurant, you know, they're not going to order that cheeseburger. Like, I guess the question is, if you can predict that with pretty much 100% accuracy, um, are you saying that vegan person had no free will in that matter to choose the yeah. burger? I guess they could have. I guess they could have, but they could have. We could predict they wouldn't unless they thought of, unless they knew that we were trying to predict them, and then they wanted to consciously defy us. And then maybe that was their act of free will. I don't know. Well, I don't know if it's fair to say that when we are able to know what we want and consistently do it, that we are determined okay. to do that thing. It's more than we are able to detect and follow our own preferences. And so that person knows they're not going to eat meat. It's not like they have a compulsion not to eat meat. Or maybe they, mm. they sort of do. Or maybe it's kind of gross to them. But um, I would put it that they have a very strongly internalized value of not eating meat. And that they express that value in their choices. And, uh, you know, if suddenly they were starving and meat was all there was, I'm sure they could go against that value or, or over, overcome that de determinism uh, in favor of staying alive. Wow. Yeah. Okay. This is a good point. You, you use the word compulsion. You know, a lot of philosophers of free will uh, will argue from a um, compatibilist point of view that, that we have freedom as long as we're not compulsively you know there, like there's a number of conditions that have to be met and one of them is you know not internal distractions that cause us to uh have compulsions or um or being externally controlled yeah. like being tied down right yeah, and yeah. being like, told you must eat meat right or something like that um that was a weird example that just <laughs> <laughs> we were very weird very weird but anyway well, actually my grand my grandfather did uh my father-in-law did that to my daughter one time at thanksgiving dinner you must eat the turkey. Wow. She was a, a vegetarian. Was quite obnoxious, let me tell you. Wow. Wow. I hope the young lady did not grow up with PTSD, PTSD yeah. from that. Well, um, I would answer this, yeah. this line of questioning by referring to self-determination theory, which um, you know, underlies most of my work. And it, it makes a distinction between feeling a compulsion to do something uh, it calls that interjected motivation you feel guilty you're making yourself do it and internal motivation or internalized where you're fully standing behind behind it and so if you are acting with a compulsion it's true you do not feel as free and that is you know a long-term finding of self-determination theory and when you act with that sense of not being free, it negatively affects your well-being. So it's important to have a sense of acting um, freely. But I take a little bit of a stronger position in the book, and I say that it's always us making the choices whether we feel compelled to, compelled to do them or not. Uh, we're signing off on mm -hmm. them. And, you know, it's sort of that existential perspective where, you know, that Jean-Paul Sartre where, you're responsible no matter what. You reveal who you are by your choices. Choice is scary. You know, people might try to avoid from choice or escape from freedom in uh, Eric Fromm's terms. Mm. Nevertheless, yes. we're always responsible. And so I don't think we're off the hook by saying, I felt compelled to do that. I think the answer to that is, well, that's oh. sort of an immature position to be uh, doing your living your life from and you should try to get over that and with some work uh, maybe some therapy hopefully you can yeah this uh, tying it to self-determination theory is fascinating um you know you can hear the this the skeptics uh, i can hear their their voice in my head saying like 
<laughs> okay, well, feeling like you have free will doesn't mean you have free will. <laughs> like, like just feeling like you're autonomous, yeah, yeah. you know, doesn't take away the fact that we don't act. I mean, it's just a mirage. It's just an illusion. But yeah. then, you know, you come back and you say, I mean, I think I can do like the whole like artificial intelligence chat between you and the other person even. <laughs> so yeah, let yeah. me get your, let me allow you to actually say it. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I'm trying to predict what you would say right now. <laughs> Isn't that funny <laughs> from a meta level of this well, discussion? <laughs> just, just rephrase the question real quick for me. No, I mean, I'm just seeing a conversation unfold between you and a skeptic. Uh, or not a skeptic, but a determinist, a hard determinist, or even a yeah, determinist yeah, yeah. Uh, who, yeah. a soft, even a soft determinist, you know, within the yeah. field who's like, well, you know, just feeling like you're free doesn't make you free. <laughs> it's you didn't have any control. You didn't have any choice over feeling free anyway. Yeah, yeah. 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 Well, that's a funny thing that um, self-determination theory is not directly addressed to free will question. It is just said that the feeling Mm -hmm. of freedom is important. And so I am taking that additional step. And I'm even making the quite radical and it's I'm not fully standing behind it, but I think it's plausible. The radical argument that free will is an evolved capacity of the human mind. Again, defining this as the capacity to ask ourselves what we want and make a choice. And I think mm-hmm. that, you know, given the complexity of, you know, the social environments that we face and, um, you know, we have to be able to make it up on the fly and figure out what's going on and make decisions constantly. And so I think that's the capacity that, that we evolved, or at least to ask ourselves, what do I want? Okay, I'll do this. Um that doesn't mean that there were no constraints on what we were doing. You know, of course, um, you know, if I was if I was hungry, then I might choose to eat instead of you know going to the library and checking out the book. But this this point you raised about well, we don't know why we want want something. We don't know why we made that choice, and so we can't be free. I do take exception to that because. Um, It makes it so the only free being is an omniscient entity that knows everything about itself. And, Mm -hmm. of course, we are not that. I don't think anything is that. If you insist that that's what free will means, then I have to agree with you. It doesn't exist because we don't know everything about ourselves. But uh, we know enough, hopefully, to keep sailing the ship, you know, through the seas of our lives, hopefully in some coherent direction towards meaningful goals that we, that we've chosen. Um, Do we know why we've chosen those goals? No, we don't know the brain processes that, you know, the neurons that summed and and created that are are making that choice. But on another, on another, the other hand, we do know why we made that choice. That's the one we thought we wanted. And only we in our mm-hmm. conscious experience at that moment were in a position to make that determination. So it's sort of tricky, mm-hmm. you know, it's that this is mm-hmm. the kind of compatibilism that I'm talking about. Well, did you did you by any chance watch my two part series with Sam Harris on free will? Um, I did not get a chance to, but it's on my list for the Christmas break. Amazing, because we we kind of get at it a little bit. We we go at it, go at it a little bit. You know, he's a friend, but you know, we have different opinions on this matter. And I can and, well and, imagine uh, this. Sti- yeah, there was this sticking point where you know he he was talking about cello and and I, how I love cello and how I'd love to teach him how to play cello. And he said he said I have no choice in the matter. I do not want to play cello. He's like he's like I do not have any motivation to play cello. Uh, so therefore, I have no free will in playing cello. And I said that's that's ridiculous like i you can override you can we can do things we're not motivated to want to do right we can we, that's the will <laughs> you know that's like you know we we can you know you know just because our system one is telling us we're not interested in something doesn't mean we can't use system two to to consciously to push through something it's not yeah. like i want to motivate to go to the gym every time but yeah. he just didn't see it that way you know yeah. and it, it was a little frustrating probably for both of us <laughs> to, yeah. in that that conversation yeah. i can imagine yeah. The way I could see Sam coming to want to play the cello is if he's got this self-concept of I'm not a musical guy, yet at some level of him there's a, a talents or capacities that have been undeveloped. And after his conversation with you, perhaps he would have um, started to think a little bit about, well, you know what, that's not such a bad idea. Um, I've always kind of half thought it might be fun to learn a musical instrument and 
you know, the cello is really pretty nice. You start listening to mm -hmm. cello pieces and you could come around to wanting to play the cello. And it wouldn't be that he was overcoming his system one resistance. It would be that he was overcoming his um, inaccurate self-concept. Mm. So that's one way to well, sort of flip that's an interesting reframing. Yeah. <laughs> that's a very interesting reframing. Um, you know, uh, there's a there's a quote that I love from William James where he said, my first act of free will shall be to believe in free will. And and actually the context, I'm sure you're familiar with that quote, right? Yeah, yeah, I've heard it. I'm sure you have. I'm sure you have. Uh, the context surrounding that quote is really even more interesting because he suffered with depression and even some suicidal thoughts in his life. Um, deep, deep depression. Um, and he, and apparently after he said that and made that deliberation, his whole life changed. And it just, it's fascinating to think the extent to which those beliefs matter within our own head. I mean, Sam, by the way, Sam Harris would be the first one to argue that belief matters. I mean, that's why he rails against uh, religions, fundamentalist religions yeah, yeah. that uh, maybe have some dangerous ideologies. You yeah. know, obviously the contents of our mind can influence greatly how we act in the world and our agency. So, um, it just seems like um, you're arguing in a lot of ways that the stories we that we tell ourselves with a symbolic mind um they that they that that matters for our free will it sounds like that's a big part of what you're saying is that right it is because um in order to make choices between the alternatives that we have called into our minds there has to be a sense of being a person who cares and, and i call this the symbolic self uh, i draw from some work by Konstantin setakides and john skaronsky on the evolution of the symbolic self, a fascinating 1997 article. And they said that in order for us to interact in this complex social world with language, with all these other um, humans, we needed to evolve a sense of being a person with a history and preferences. And, and we feel ourselves being that person, even though, in a sense, it's just a just a hallucination, you know, it's a product of our minds. But mm. I'm, I'm making the argument that it has top down control or some degree of or influence, at least, over the choices that get made um, according to mm. its own preferences. So it comes down to this sort of hierarchical perspective on the organization of matter that I talk about uh, in one of the chapters yeah, in reality. the book. And I don't know if you want to get into that, but. Um, I'll just say briefly that I think that evolution has, in the process of life evolving, um, more and more complex levels of control have showed up. And each one has been selected for because it regulates the level below, right? So when you, the first cell had to have the capacity to regulate the chemicals coming in and out of the cell. The first multicellular organism had to have the capacity to regulate how the different cells were interacting with each other. Eventually, we got a nervous system that takes uh, control of that. And so I follow that logic all the way up, and I say, well, you've got a brain, and then you've got cognitive processes controlling that brain, and then you've got self-processes controlling the cognitive processes. You know, so that's where our own sort of agency originates. But then it continues up from there. We are nested within social relationships and, and social spheres, mm -hmm. and those can try to control us. And, and that's mm -hmm. a lot of what self-determination theory is about, is how we deal with feeling controlled by other people. And it says mm -hmm. people with power over us should support our autonomy so that we can maximize our sense of self-determination and um, get the benefits of being embedded in these social relationships instead of just being oppressed by them. So it's a really unique, I think, way of framing kind of an old idea that goes back to Le Comte, a French theorist in the 19th century, mm. uh, the hierarchy of the sciences. And the, I, I, this is something I believe pretty strongly, that each new level of organization um, builds upon the rest, but it is somewhat independent of what's below 
given its ability to regulate what happens down below. You know, so if I decide to go off for a run this morning, I don't usually do that, but suppose I did, suddenly my all the physical stuff in my body is having to deal with the stress of running, the physiology, and that was all determined by a conscious decision I made uh, that morning. And so the hard-headed skeptic is going to say, well, you don't know why you chose to run. And I could say, well, I don't know where that idea came from, but I liked it and I picked it. That's why I ran. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah, I, I mean, in a, in kind of a nutshell, you're just saying you don't like reductionism. <laughs> you, yeah, don't, think, you don't like taking the mind and reducing it to the brain, even. Yeah, I don't. I think reduction is reductionism is hugely important, and it's taught us so much. But I think it's mainly useful when the system is breaking down. You say, oh, they have sickle cell anemia. What's wrong? You know, the blood system's not working. Well, the cells that compose that system are misshapen. Or hmm. a person, I talk about the example of Charles Whitman uh, in the 60s who uh, shot a bunch of people from a bell tower in Texas. And it turned out he had a tumor in his brain. Well, he wasn't able to make... A, a good free choice because his brain didn't support it. And so right. I, I would say that reductionism mainly works when you're trying to explain why the system has failed. Uh, but then yeah. if you're going to talk about what the system does, you know, then you need to know what's going on at the higher level. Right. So when I drive out to the interstate, mm -hmm. I either go left or right None of my machinery determines which way it is. It's my intention to go to either St. Louis or Kansas City that's uh, controlling my machinery in that case. Yeah. You're, you're, um, I, I assume you've read the book Freedom Evolves by Daniel Dennett? Uh, I have leafed through it. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's pretty dense stuff, but a lot of good, good ideas in there. It seems... Uh very, very compatible with your argument. Yeah. Very compatible with your argument, except you put a more of a psychological machinery around, around it. I mean, he just argues that we have a lot of these abilities that, uh, abilities that we evolved that give us a free will worth wanting. Um, and that's essentially what you're saying, but you are able to flesh that out in a lot of ways with, um, neuroscience and with self-determination theory, your, re your, uh, groundbreaking research and goals. Yeah, your work, your work has really been very impactful in the field of positive psychology, field of psychology overall. It's, uh, it's certainly influenced my work as well, I should say. And the work you've done, the breadth of it on, on goals and as well as well-being, um, and particularly the link between goals and well-being is kind of your niche. <laughs> that's your, yeah, that's yeah. your thing. That's um, been my thing. Yeah, I know. I, I, I see you. I see you. <laughs> I see you. I get you. <laughs> And it's really made a substantial impact. So to be in the field of psychology, to be able to link that to the free will debate, it just was super fascinating to me to read. I will say one of the things that was super fascinating for me to read as well was your discussion of the default mode network, uh, because I've been studying the default mode network uh, with my colleagues and linking it to creative thinking. Right. And you don't make that direct link, but you have a chapter on the default mode network and you do have a separate chapter on creativity. And so maybe we can make that link together right now. Yeah. More explicit. Well, I'm actually working on a review chapter right now with a, a self-determination theory neuroscientist named Wugle Lee, where we're making that connection. Uh, and we're saying that um, we're asking the question, how do we decide what to do next? And we're um, mm. outlining that question using control theory and the cybernetic perspective, but we're also looking at the brain processes, and we're concluding that there's interplay between um, central executive network, salience network, and the default mode network, uh, where there's back and forth between the, the prefrontal cortex uh, and consciousness, a question arises as arises, say, in a creator's mind when they're trying to solve a problem. And then we don't know the answer to that question, but um, the fact that it was a conscious experience broadcasts it to the, the broader or lower mind and starts to work on it at a non-conscious level. Um, and the default mode network processes are a big part of that. 
And then the Salience Network at one point sort of notices, whoa, some thought that's just sort of wandered across the default mode view screen and says, that's important. And then we say, whoa, and then we can make a choice and, and maybe realize that we need to completely change what we've been doing in our life. So in that last chapter in the book, I make a connection between the process of um, make, changing your life, adopting a whole new set of goals, and the creative process using that um, four-stage model of um, Wallace of preparation, preparation, incubation, illumination, elaboration. And so, mm -hmm. yes, I am kind of trying to link those two chapters right now in this uh, review article that we're writing. And it's pretty exciting because I think it's original stuff that we're pulling together. That's great. Let me know if I can help at all. Um, you know, if you just want to even talk to me about the research we've conducted on the topic. You know, I would um, love to, be to send you a, um, just if you wouldn't mind taking a quick read of this draft when we finish it. Yeah. Because, uh, I'd love to. If it have a to. lot of holes, then your expertise would be great to, to check on. That. I'd love to. I'd love to. Yeah, I'm so excited that you're working on that. Um, you know, we have listeners and might not be familiar with anything we're really talking about right now. So let's uh, let's <laughs> talk a little about what the default mode network. What the world are we talking about? Um, there see, there seems to be a particular net brain network that the cognitive neuroscientists discovered by accident because. They didn't really seem to care much about what people were doing in the fMRI machine when they weren't doing the task that was assigned yeah, to yeah. them. Um, and it seemed to be like, oh, wow, maybe there's some value to the inner stream of consciousness, as William James would put it. Um, how would you characterize the major functions of the default mode network? Because there's a lot of like kind of debate in the field about exactly what it does. Yeah. Well, it does a bunch of different things. And um, that's true. I think it's involved both in executive control and in mind wandering. You know, which makes it you know, hard to, to disentangle all the different mm -hmm. stuff. But um, I think of it as when we're just sort of not doing anything in particular, we don't have a cybernetic tote loop. We don't have a goal that's mm -hmm. active in our mind. We're not doing something. We're just hanging out in our mind in a sort of a free flowing state. And so, you know, we used to think that, didn't mean anything. It was just mind wandering. But now we think that default activity is critical for sort of processing what's going on and connecting things up with our goals and motives and linking memories in spontaneous ways that can arise to consciousness uh, and sometimes can present us with the aha moment that this is the solution to the question or the problem I've been trying to solve. Mm. So the default mode network, I think, arguably is us, you know, when we're not doing anything as compared mm. to the focused mode when we're, fo we're trying to solve a problem. But a lot of times we're not doing that. We're just kind of zoning along. I would, but that doesn't mean we're not doing anything. We're, it's kind of like dreaming, but at a more conscious level, we're kind of processing, making connections, wondering stuff and, remembering things and reflecting on what somebody said the other day and maybe feeling guilty because we haven't um, uh, connected with our sick friend that we heard about and the friend wonders about us and that bugs a little bit. And then we realize, hey, I saw this great cake baking recipe and I know I could bake that cake for my friend and take it to, to him or her. You know, so it's mm -hmm. the, the default mode network is the part between action, but it's critical because it provides a lot of the spark to return to the next action, to adopt the next goal. And we don't know a lot about that process, to be honest. It's surprising how little personality and cybernetic models have looked at that. Like even the Carver and Shire model of goals doesn't mm. say, where did the goals come from? How do we get that goal? Right. It just said right. we picked the action that's that's uh, determined by our, the higher level goals in our system, right? So I want to be a compassionate person, so I will pick the thing to do that you know expresses my compassion. But um, you know, a lot of times we're doing something new, we're, we're winging it, and we don't have any 
big pre-existing idea, but we're still figuring out what to do next. And I think the default mode has a lot to do with that, but there's a lot to be figured out with that as well. And I'm, I'm just starting to learn about um, the neuroscience of all this. Yeah, it's tricky stuff. Um, I, I One thing I do want to double click on is I do think a lot of the functions of the default mode network are do form the core of human existence. Um, is how I phrased yeah, yeah, yeah. it, and I do think that's true. Um, I think that the default mode network can couple and decouple with the executive attention network uh, to various degrees, depending on the different stages of the creator process. Yeah, yeah. For different, if, you know, sometimes we can focus intensely on our daydreams, so we can have positive. As my my uh, mentor Jerome L. Singer called, positive constructive daydreaming is uh-huh. probably when the default mode is linked and coupled to our deep attention uh resources or working memory resources yeah yeah so uh yeah these things could be all these different kind of brain networks you also mentioned the salience network which i think is one of the most underrated brain networks i'm glad that you mentioned the salience network that seems to be really important for creativity to be able to see what may count as a creative solution um, in the first place um so i think that's wonderful that you brought that in but all these kinds of brain networks couple and decouple constantly you know that it's where it's for full and back and forth you know and um and so you know the brains are constantly dynamic you know uh, you know all this but i, I think yeah, yeah. we need to explain this to to our listeners you know so the but how it all impinges on the free will debate it's still not uh completely clear to me because someone can say that you know all of this is is you maybe you're talking about human will but it's not free will because a lot of people narrowly view free will as could you have done differently yeah. in that specific, if you rewinded the tape at that specific precise moment, would you ever have acted differently yeah. than, and, and, and um, you're talking a lot about the things we do after the moment to f- change the course of our future, you know, because I've called it the imagination network. I've called the default mode, the imagination network, because it, yeah. it, it can impact our future, but, does it really impact the notion of free will, though? Yeah. Well, again, I'm not arguing for magic free will, independent of all the machinery. Right. Um, I think that we have this mental ability to take stock of, of who we are, where we are, and what we want, and make some decisions. And could we have done differently? I think that almost might be a nonsensical question, because... You, first of all, you can't go back to that moment and say, okay, do something different or not. It's already happened. And so everything that's already happened has already happened. So I don't, you know, it's a, to ask, could you have done differently is to ask, could the universe have turned out any differently at this moment since it began 14 right. billion years ago? It's kind of the same question. I think it's more useful to ask, could I have done differently? And if you think about it, a lot of times you were poised between two or three almost equally attractive options. And, you know, you picked one. And mm. maybe you later realized you wished you hadn't done that. And so you would pick differently the mm. next time. But at the time, you picked the thing that looked most appealing. And so why would you have picked differently from that? You picked the thing that you wanted. And so why would it be free will to think that you – have the capacity to pick what you don't want. And actually, now that I think about it, that's part of what I'm saying free will is. We have the capacity to pick what we don't want. Yeah, free free won't. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, well, I mean, yeah. we can make bad decisions. We can look the last chapter of my book talks about a, a woman who made a bad career decision decades ago and has been miserable ever since until finally her miser- misery inspired her to start asking the questions uh, what do I really want? Where her non-conscious mind started to provide her with some alternatives until she was finally able to pick something different. And I think that's all you can really ask for, you know, an agent to, uh, regarding free will, the ability to pick what we think we want and learn from our mistakes. Learn from our mistakes. Well, that that takes us out of the realm of how a lot of philosophers define narrowly. They define it, it's like it's like they can't think of free will outside of the rewind the tape thing. Yeah, <laughs> Do you know yeah. what I mean? <laughs> yeah, I don't, the rewind the tape thing doesn't. It's a yeah, thought experiment yeah. that I don't think is very coherent. Yeah. 
Damn, Ken, Ken dropped in the gauntlet right there. I mean, I'm probably just not getting it. You, you should have snapped. You should have snapped with that and get a little sassy. <laughs> get a little sassy over there. <laughs> well, you know, no, I hear you, brother. I hear you, brother. Um, I'm a big fan of the a lot of Daniel Dennett's writings on the the, the abilities that are they give us a free will worth wanting. I gotta go look at I that. I do again. think a lot of things. I, I was not thinking yeah, about that. It's, it's so. Before. Okay, well, I, you, you'll see a great friend, uh, a great friend there of ideas, you know. So I've always, uh, yeah, I, I'm, I'm a big, I'm a big fan of those ideas. I'm a big fan of, um, of you making the case that the, a lot of the kinds of system two functions we're talking about are are things that they are free wills worth wanting in the Daniel Dennett's terms. But in your terms, you're saying there's, you're straight up saying that's free will, and so that's fascinating because well, you, you're just like straight up, you're like no. You're like, no, we got more free will than you realize. <laughs> We're doomed to have free will. Yeah. Yeah. That's a f- yeah, funny yeah. way to flip yeah. it around. But that's that's the existentialist yeah. in me, you know, that's saying yeah. um, there ain't nobody else making our choices but us. We might like to think so, but um, we're responsible. Mm. And that's scary, but it's also tremendously empowering if you fully grasp it. Hmm. Yeah, and I know that's another major theme of your work is uh, the link between freedom and responsibility. Um, I assume you've read Roll May's stuff. Yeah, this, yeah. In the sixties, I'm, I'm an old humanist um, going from way back, I'm mostly a Rogerian, yeah, but um, some yeah. of the other folks as well I've read. Yeah, Roll May wrote beautifully about about that interplay, and I think I love that you brought in brought that in, you know, to this this whole debate and. Um, it's just, it's very interesting because you have like a whole chapter, um, what, what's, what's the chapter called? Uh, give me a second here. The problem of too much freedom. <laughs> That's, <Yeah>. the chapter. <laughs> That's the chapter you have. So it's like, it's interesting because there's, there's kind of different continuums that one can make in this argument. One could say, you know, w- w- a lot of people, a lot of philosophers of mind say, especially determinists say, well, look, we have a heck of a lot less free will than we realize we have then there's some like actually we have more than we realize but then i feel like you're even to the right of that continuum and saying we have so much free will that we don't know what to do with it in a way do you think do you and this might be controversial but do you think like it's easier being a determinist like if you're a hard determinist do you feel like you're evading your responsibility your destiny (laughs) you know i think that hard determinism is a deep question it's seductive yeah. because it seems like the most scientifically rigorous position to take. And it's the position that goes along with the scientific ideal of putting our subjective wants and values aside and being guided by the facts, right? And so we have this wishful thinking of wanting free will, but as true scientists, we have to put that aside. Um, I, I disagree hmm. with that. I think when we do that, it's bad for us because we're accepting an idea that isn't true and we're going to negatively impact our own functioning. Um, you know, there's quite a bit of research, experimental research on what happens when you convince people that uh, determinism is true and they become mm-hmm. less moral, less able to self-regulate, uh, less um, pro-social, um, number, they become numb to pain. So if you convince people what? that, yeah, I'm serious. Uh, the complex attack. I want to ask you a follow up question to that because is the, has anyone ever done the study on different philosophers and psychologists and what they believe in their actual morality? Like that from that level, wouldn't that be interesting? Wouldn't that be an interesting study? Like are hard determinists more immoral? <laughs> you know, I would be a fascinating study, and a version that I've thought about yeah. it is: does an evolutionary psychologist who thinks that men evolved to be philanderers? have less ability to right. control their um, uh, right. unfortunate choices with their female graduate students. You know, I think free will can, uh, determinism can, you know, make you think you're not responsible. I had to do that. Yeah. And so that's another you're right. besides the well-being hit that you take with those beliefs. Yeah. I think it's a dangerous belief. Wow, you even go so far to say that 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 it's a dangerous belief. Um, <laughs> you know, I don't care. I'm getting to the end of my career. I'll just say what I think. And 
people don't like it. That's you have funny. no fucks to give. <laughs> I love it. About for you, about for you, like Ken, Ken's like, I got zero fucks to give in the, in this debate. Um, it's, you know, I hear you. The idea of whether or not it's a dangerous idea is, is I, I can, again, I can hear the, um, the voice in my head of the, the hard determinist saying, cause I've debated so much with them. So I can kind of like, hear what their counter to everything you say is and i think they would say that it makes them more compassionate because you realize that people even in their most poorest choices really didn't have a choice ultimate ultimately and that that should give us all more more compassion for each other not less so i I can hear them saying that as a rebuttal to what you're saying um yeah that's kind of what my dad was saying it's a bit of a liberal perspective of you you know, forgive people of their crimes <laughs> if they came from a terrible, you know, background. And I don't That's think very liberal, yes. I don't think we can really afford to say that because the question of who is really off the hook versus isn't is very tricky. I think you're only really off the hook if you've got some organic problems. And that's once again determinism only makes sense when there's a problem down in the machinery, or reductionism only mm. makes sense. Um, so if your machinery's off, then okay, you're off the hook. But if you're just making bad choices, and then you're saying, "Well, I couldn't help it," um, I think that's again a dangerous thing to a dangerous road to go down. Wow. Okay. Okay. Um, let's let's end this interview talking a little about the importance of brains working together. You know, you have this chapter called "Living Well Together." Um, you know, man. <laughs> Have you, are you familiar with the extended brain hypothesis that uh, David Chalmers and Andy Clark put forward and that uh, Annie Murphy Paul wrote about in a recent book? Uh, nope. And that sounds like another one I got to check out. I, I think I'm going to be familiar Amazing. with the arguments once you explain it to me quickly. Go ahead. Oh, yeah. You'll, you'll definitely. I mean, well, just that there are, that our brains don't stop and start enclosed in this head that, that we are deeply deeply embodied and connected to others um and and our brain is extended beyond just this 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 <laughs> skin here it just it seems very much in line with your your living well together chapter we talk about how we really influence each other's it, it, we really influence each other's free will in yeah. profound ways right yeah. it's not all strictly in an individual pursuit the pursuit yeah. of free will right yeah, and that sounds consistent with what I've been, uh, what I say in the book about this multi-level hierarchy of organization, where we are also nested within uh, groups of other minds, and we're influenced by them, but we also influence them, and it's critical for our our well-being and our adaptation. I would argue to be able to um, f- form coherent groups, uh, alliances, coalitions in evolutionary terminology. And so we're not just um, not just these abstract entities stuck in our heads. We're also connected to other minds out there in the world, um, hopefully in a way that benefits mm. everybody. So it sounds like a really cool idea in another book I have to go look up, Scott. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Look it up. Let me just look up real quick the title of Mandy Murphy Paul's new book. She basically summarizes the the work. Her book is called The Extended Mind um, by Annie Murphy Paul. Um, the subtitle is The Power of Thinking Outside the Brain. <laughs> uh, Annie's a dear friend of mine, and uh, yeah, I think it's a cool book. Yeah, and I think I do like the idea of us thinking about free will more than uh, just an individualistic pursuit, right? I mean, we influence each other's and each other in such profound ways we limit each other's freedom not just internally but also externally the liberals got something right there uh to a certain degree your father yeah. is right <laughs> it and but it's not the whole story but you know it is part of the story for sure yeah yeah well this is this was has been great um is there anything else you want to add uh that you haven't said i i guess i would just reiterate that um i can't prove and nobody can prove that free will exists I think it's mm-hmm. likely if you think about it the right way, and I think about it the way Kristen List, List laid out his philosophical arguments. But even if it's not true, uh, the illusion of freedom, if you want to call that, makes a huge difference. And it might even o- operate like a kind of placebo effect that it, even though it's an illusion, uh, it makes itself true to a considerable extent. 
in that if you believe in it, suddenly you're doing things that are better for you and making you happier and making you adapt and thrive to a greater extent. So whether you want to call that an illusion, I think is, you know, I think it's going mm. too far to just say it's an illusion. I say it's an adaptation, but, um, mm. you know, we can go around and around <laughs> with these things. <laughs> Linguistics, you can call it an adaptive illusion, but then you don't really like calling it an illusion. Yeah, no, I hear you. I mean, it's like, um, religion, right? Like, yeah. or belief in God, <laughs> you, yeah. you know, like, uh, we don't know for sure. It, it's sort of like a similar argument to what you're saying. We yeah. may never, we probably won't ever know while we're alive. You know, maybe we'll find out someday. That, yeah. Oh, hey, God, <laughs> you do exist <laughs> after all. Dude. But, um, but <laughs> it's hard. It's hard to know that right now. Yeah. Right. And, and I, I uh, don't know. I don't yeah. know the truth of this and, and neither does anybody else. But um, does it is true that it is like a religion to people. You know, determinism is like yeah. a religion to people. Yeah. Free will might be like a religion to me. I don't know. Um, I would agree with Sam Harris. I do think that. Um, uh, mm. God is a delusion. The religion is a delusion, but I can't be sure about that either. Oh my gosh. Um, yeah. So yeah. really you just have to be sort of agnostic if you're going to be uh, humble in the end. Ken Sheldon letting it all hang out here at the end of his career. God is dead. <laughs> <laughs> and fr- But we have free will. That's, that's interesting. Usually you find a lot of the really deep religious Christians believe we have free will. Yeah. It's an interesting, isn't that interesting? You often find they do believe in yeah, free will. God gave it um, to anyway, us, though. But, well, that's what it is, I guess, is that God gave it to us. They I would believe. say evolution um, gave well, this, it to us. Yeah. But, uh, there you go. Who, well, who gave us evolution? <laughs> evolution is a chance <laughs> process. <clears throat> anyway, um, I won't go down that rabbit hole too much at this point, but we can do that over some beers someday or some wine. Um, really great chatting with you. Um, and thanks for um, writing this really provocative book. I appreciate it. It was fun reconnecting with you and we should do it more often. Likewise. <laughs> Thanks for listening to this episode of the Psychology Podcast. If you'd like to react in some way to something you heard, I encourage you to join in the discussion at thepsychologypodcast.com or on our YouTube page, The Psychology Podcast. We also put up some videos of some episodes on our YouTube page as well, so you'll want to check that out. Thanks for being such a great supporter of the show, and tune in next time for more on the mind, brain, behavior, and creativity.